All right, uh, Kevin, uh, what do you have a title for your radical pessimist entry yeah. today? Uh, it's the end of the double exception. No, really. The end of the double exception. Kevin Harris, uh, the radical pessimist, right here on WNUR as this is hell, live from Washington, D.C. All right, let's hear it. Okay. This is not the big news that Chuck promised, but we'll talk about the big news afterwards, I guess so. Well, we, we find ourselves, listeners, in the middle of some sort of massive wave of unrest right now, political fomentation in the Middle East and beyond. There are not a lot of these sort of historical waves. Something like this happened in the late 18th century in the U.S. and France and in Haiti. In 1848, in Europe and elsewhere, in 1910s and 1920s in Russia and much of Latin America. And again, the 1960s and the rest of the Third World. Well, sometimes revolutions happen all by themselves, but a lot of them happen as part of a chain reaction that combines the possibilities for a change on the ground, being suddenly recognized by inspiration from abroad. It is said, by those who say it, that there are two outcomes for every great revolution. One is the outcome within the country. The other is the effect it has on the rest of the world. France in 1789... Russia in 1917, China in 1949, Iran in 1979, these all had dual effects. So but it's undoubtedly too soon to tell whether the protests in the Middle East will result in massive social change in the long run uh, in the region. But it is soon enough for me to argue that we've upended two deep myths about how Americans could see the world. These two myths are two different types of exceptionalisms, one about the Middle East, the other about us. What is Middle East exceptionalism? It doesn't have much to do with, with the Middle East, which is not really a region if you take high school geography seriously. If you consider countries with Muslim majorities as Middle Eastern, then you have to include the two most populous Muslim countries in the world that aren't in the standard definition. Indonesia and Pakistan, and throw in India in there too because it has a larger Muslim population than any Middle Eastern country. Maybe it's a geographical entity, the Middle East. But that begs the question East of what? Middle of what? The Middle East is not a continent, it's a direction on a compass. And it only reads East if you hold it from Europe. If you're in China, you're talking about West, Western Asia. Is the Middle East the so-called Arab world? Well, Iran's in the Middle East, supposedly, as well as Turkey and Israel and some Kurds, maybe some Afghans. So it's not an ethnic identity either. I mean, the category is pretty useless, actually, unless, unless one is speaking about something in the world where there is a lack. And the Middle East stands as the placeholder for most people in the U.S. who need the opposite of a particular category they like to celebrate about themselves. America has freedom. The Middle East has unfreedom, dictatorship, autocracy, etc. The West has a competitive capitalist economy. The Middle East's only economic activity is selling oil. Other, other parts of the world settle their differences through trade and cultural exchange with the Middle East through violence. Oh, we treat our women so well that they dance for us with the stars on TV. Perhaps even dancing on ice, if we are lucky. But in the Middle East, all women are oppressed. There is no dancing, and there is no ice. Well, for conservatives, the West is Christian, and for liberals, the West is secular. But for both, the Middle East represents some kind of obscurantist force known as Islam. You know, there's a YouTube video making the Internet rounds right now, which shows a bunch of Orange County Californians protesting outside of a mosque and holding a rally against a local Muslim community organization that features some local polls calling for blood. It's pretty hateful stuff, and I find it difficult to watch, but the interesting thing about it is that the yelling and screaming they do has little to do with any kind of Islamic belief I'm aware of. Uh, I realize now that the only difference between Orange County conservatives and the bleacher bums at Wrigley Field who are known also for their um, aggressive discourse, is that Orange County at least got California to put a cap on property taxes. 
Now, the point here is that most of the discussion of the Middle East as an exceptional region only exists as an idea in order to make us feel exceptional. When you go to countries in the Middle East, they'll gladly tell you this, actually, in T-shirt form. You can watch people twirl around in Turkey or ride a camel in Cairo. But um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, America, but uh, this is all just crap cooked up for tourists. I mean, sure, there's, there's, there's differences, but not in the places that we expect. I mean, almost every young guy in the Middle East I've ever met likes the band Queen. Well, some of them don't like Queen, though. That's the difference I've noticed in the Middle East. It's an important difference. There are Queen haters and there are Queen lovers. And, you know, there are, unfortunately, yes, some people in the Middle East who, because of their traditions and poor schooling, perhaps in Saudi-funded madrasas where... One is not instructed in enlightenment principles and does not lend respect for our global culture and civilization. They, they like the doors. But I can report to you, listeners, that the Middle East blind faith in the doors can be fought within their own countries because there are also people in the region who realize the doors were a load of crap. So if you're listening, Obama, we must support these moderate forces of reform if our way of life is to survive. Anyway, the bigger point is that. And it should have been obvious anyway, politics in Middle Eastern countries and the demands and aspirations of people in these countries are the same as the rest of the world. There's no magic bullet that explains away the history of the area. Not Islam, not oil, not the defeatist mind of the Arab. None of it was really the best way to understand these countries. But these were the myths that we told ourselves and continue to do so. I mean, Thomas Friedman's last column in the New York Times where he counted Obama's Cairo speech and Google Earth as some of the main causes of the protests in Egypt were, was a masterful exercise in denying people responsibility for making their own history. Better to rethink why we, here in the U.S., held the region to be so exceptional for the past three decades, at least. I think it's because the U.S., like any nation, has its own myth of exceptionalism that it applies to itself as the unspoken framework beneath its own view of the world. This exceptionalism takes conservative and liberal varieties. And even the left has its own myths about American superiority. But we've learned that over the past few weeks, even if the U.S. tries to manage the changes on the ground to their benefit, they're really not in control. And the ideology of U.S. power, that it can be a benign superpower, one that is different from earlier superpowers, one that can balance its interests and its values better than any other country, is morally bankrupt. If you notice, protesters in Wisconsin are now borrowing tactics of sit-ins and public building occupations from Egyptians, openly. This implies that the Middle East is no longer the negative image of the United States. We see there what we want to happen here. And for the U.S., that's a pretty damn exceptional thing. Chuck. All right, so... Which one of these things was the biggest factor in causing the uprisings in the Middle East, in the Arab world? Was it Obama's Cairo speech, Google Earth, Google's CEO who was in Egypt, WikiLeaks, Twitter, or Bush's war on terror? (laughs) You forgot about Thomas Friedman's mustache. He played a big role. (laughs) There's also a uh, there's a some it's an elderly guy. He wrote a book on activism that's like ninety some pages long. That they it was yeah. a, a Gene Sharp. Yeah, that's it, Gene Sharp. So is it Gene Sharp? Uh, you know, I I they, that was his stuff was translated into Arabic and stuff. I don't know. You know, there, again, there's, there's there's some there's a portion of the left that thinks that, you know, you can get millions of people in the street through these kind of nefarious and or, you know, benign democracy planning organizations in, in D.C. Um, and even the Gene Sharp guy has a, is tied to some you know, the Albert Einstein Institute, and they were blamed for, um, you know, uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine and all these things, you know, which, you know, it's, I just, I mean, yeah, they, they, they do have an impact on the way that, you know, particular ideas are formed and how people discuss tactics. But, you know, we have a thing in sociology that says something can be necessary but not sufficient, right? So maybe it was necessary for, like, these things to get to, 
you know, to be uh, brought in and discussed, whatever. But that doesn't have sufficient. You can't go around and then and say that these things caused the revolutions or the, the unrest. It's totally, totally bon- bonkers. And you know, this, this watching this stuff in Egypt on TV. You know, I was in Iran when the Green Movement demonstrations were going on, and I was talking to you on the show. And if you're actually ever in one of these things, then it's 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 so easy to call BS when somebody from afar tries to make up bogus reasons, you know. A lot of it's just accidents, you know. And like, if you walk in on the street and there's 10,000 people moving past you, well, all right, you go along. A lot of it looks like the viability of it. If it looks like it's winning, it actually leads towards a, a more favorable outcome a lot of times. So anyway, it, I would hesitate to, uh, to give the West any credit in this stuff. So the protesters in Tahrir Square are not simply pawns of George Soros? Yeah, I know. I mean, again, I think this is the left does not uh, give people their own history, you know? <laughs> it should give them credit for the things that they do as opposed to uh, trying to take it yeah, for but themselves we... or for, for whatever theory they want to pawn off. It's really, it's really irresponsible. Yeah, but we can take credit for it. Don't you get it? It makes us feel better. I know, yeah, including the idea that the U.S., is is super hegemonic and it can and, and has its tentacles everywhere and it actually can, you know, control these things. I mean, if you, if you take a look at the at the Obama folks in the last two months, they have no clue. They're they're. I mean, they will listen to anybody. Well, I think I've been in D.C. the last two months. They listen to anybody. How crazy you are! Like you, they think they can. Uh, you know, trying to do crash courses in all these countries now. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So, you know, if you see how it actually works on the inside, you kind of lose a lot of. A lot of respect for the American Empire.